Welcome to Shattered Reality, with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Shattered hey, Kate. Hi. Hi, Farusha. How are you? <laughs> I think I'm doing okay today. B- would you believe this is our 57th show? Uh, no, I wouldn't. But well, it is. It is. It, is. it, it is. definitely is. And I'm just going to slate. Um, today is October 24th, 2017. All right? Good. And uh, we're all getting ready for Halloween around here at uh, Shattered Reality Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but today, we are proud to present someone who was our 13th guest uh, back two years ago. Uh, we have a um, we have today for your listening pleasure uh, John B. Alexander, who is a doctor of education and thanatology. He is a retired United States Army colonel, and he has so many different awards that I can't even begin to mention them. I know on his NIDS, uh, a national, oh boy, I'm, I'm going to... Investigative Discovery Science? Yes, National Institute of Discovery Science. He has a biography on there that is just one award after another. Uh, today, we're going to be mostly discussing his new book, which is called Reality Denied, First-Hand Experiences with Things That Can't Happen But Did. And the foreword is by the famous psychic Yuri Geller. So, without any further ado, John B. Alexander, Ph.D. Welcome to the show. So happy oh, to speak you. to you. Oh, thank you. Glad to be back. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I have to say, Dr. Alexander, this is Kate Valentine here now. It was such a pleasure to read your book. Uh, you're one of the few people that write in conversational tones, and it was like sitting down and having a talk with you, a very interesting person, discussing extremely interesting things. It was a very, very, very enjoyable book. Thank you. Well, well, glad you enjoyed it. Well, I did too, and um, basically what I would like to start out with, because um, your book is separated into chapters according to the type of phenomena that you experienced or witnessed or with, were with people who experienced it, rather than it being a chronological sort of um, autobiography, if you will. Right. I, so would you... I did lose some of them based on my personal experiences. Then there's a whole group on the military things that we did when I was with the uh, intelligence community that were pretty pretty interesting and very different. So you, you started out as a, an army private. You were just enlisted um, as, a, as a very young man <clears throat> and um, went on from there to finally become a colonel. And during that time, you were in Vietnam and you had uh, some very, very interesting experiences there um, as, as a, uh, in combat in, in Vietnam. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, are we talking about uh, the stuff on intuition, or uh, yes, yes, the stuff. On I'm, I'm assuming you don't watch just war stories. <laughs> no, no. I mean that. I mean, I'm sure that they're interesting, also, but not really the subject of our show. <laughs> right, I understand. No, I did a, a um, chapter called Tripwire, and uh, what I mentioned in there, there's several uh, incidents, but one in particular where I was. Uh, Entering uh, on a on well, uh, a BC uh, minefield, if you will. Now these are not like classic military minefields because they're not uh, marked or anything like that. And as I was uh, backing up, uh, because we were in contact, I suddenly stopped, and uh, <clears throat> then this Vietnamese lieutenant uh, with me starts yelling, "Mean, mean!" And I look down, and um, there's a trip wire that's running behind the heel of my boot that I've already started to put tension on. Uh-oh. So had I continued backwards for oh, and another inch, 
uh, I would have uh, set off the mine and probably taken off my legs. So uh, exactly why I stopped at that point, um, I can't quite say, but it's the type of experience that uh, military people, re uh, those in combat in particular, just recount uh, by the thousands. I mean, it's not atypical at all. Yes. Well, would you say that um, that was the beginning of your feelings of having intuition or the beginnings of your uh, experiences? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, this is decades later. <laughs> okay, so you ha I, As I started, my interest, actually, my earliest uh, recollection of such goes back to 1947. Uh, I went to a very unique uh, grade school. It was actually part of a college that became part of the University of Wisconsin. And because of that, we had a uh, radio system that was inside the school that we could put broadcasts out, and the students would periodically be tasked to, uh, you know, <clears throat> to broadcast. Uh, my very first broadcast was on UFOs. Wow. Uh, how old were you? Ten. Ten. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I, I just remember, I, 40, 47, things were just getting started. That was the, uh, wasn't that the Washington, D.C. flyover and all? Or was that in the 50s, 51, uh, 52? 52. Yeah, yeah 52, 47 yeah. was the Roswell and, uh, yeah. and um, the first sightings mm. by Kenneth Arnold, I believe, right? Right, right, right. right. And it's, uh, they had the first sightings by Kenneth Arnold, followed by a series of other sightings, and of course the infamous Roswell event, which I get into lots of trouble over, but uh, all of those things were going on uh, just about uh, that time. You also have the famous Twining memo that came out that said, uh, hey, this is a classified memo to the Air Force, not to the public, but saying, this is real, we need to take it seriously, it's not hallucinations or anything we can explain. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, and you, you have since, more in more recent times, uh, you were out in, um, I don't know, the ranch in the upper northwest, the name of which is escaping me. No, not Skinwalker, that was, that was in the southwest. Um, the, uh, where you you saw something uh, that you might you might have thought was a UFO, correct? That was a while back. Well, that yeah, that's quite a while ago. In this book, uh, an incident that's much more uh, intriguing, and this happened uh, almost a, a, a two years ago, uh, you know, right, right around this time of year. But I was following up with um, Chris Bledsoe, right, and right, a number right. of people might recognize him and the case. Uh, it, you know, we haven't got an hour to just cover that case alone, uh, but it started uh, with a sighting that uh, he and several other people had, major sighting, interactions with creepy crawlers, things hovering, uh, a... Uh, he goes home and is followed by some type of alien, gets out in the yard, goes running off, and he's captured by them, turns around and says, okay, you got me. And the alien uh, telepathically communicated, oh, you don't understand, we're here to help you, which he doesn't think much of. And then whatever this entity is, it uh, disappears as uh, Chris Jr., Chris Sr.'s son uh, shows up, who had also had a major encounter that evening uh, himself. Uh, but what he learned the next day, he just realized around noon, he says, gee, I haven't taken my medicine today. And it turns out he had had Crohn's disease, which is terribly debilitating. Indeed. And um, had, that had gone on for 12 years. And after this encounter... Uh, since then, he's never taken a pill again. What happened uh, that may be of interest is that we went down and uh, visited him and his family. We've got a lovely family, and they're all uh, involved and terribly supportive. 
So he took us down to the uh, river. The initial incident had happened on the Cape Fear River, just a few miles from uh, his home. And we went down there. It was getting early evening, and we came back up, and he's showing us where, you know, this happened here, and here's where I saw this and all that. So we get back up in an empty field, and uh, uh, Chris and I are leaning against the car talking about it. Victoria was along, and uh, uh, she and his daughter got in the back seat of the car and were talking. That's getting... Uh, it's it's dark, but you know, just turned that way. And as we're discussing it, all of a sudden he goes, "Oh, I think they're here." And within about ten seconds, all of a sudden something pops into view and goes zipping off uh, to the south. Um, and what's of specific interest, of course, is the temporal relationship between the time him saying. I think they're here, and the objects appearing. Hmm. It, it got my attention, it, much more so than the, the incident uh, up in Washington. Right, that was uh, that was some some time ago, and from your last book. But with the Bledsoe family here, you you also took a trip to Mount. Uh, um, Mount Charleston, outside of Las Vegas, and I sure. I, we we live in uh, Las Vegas, and. Uh, uh, he and some other friends were out visiting, and they they wanted to try and interact uh, because uh, <clears throat> the premise being that um, uh, whatever it is, this form of consciousness or whatnot, uh, can be attracted. And uh, so we went up, and we were about. Uh, well, most people don't know Las Vegas is only two thousand feet high, but the mountain goes up to uh, nearly twelve thousand feet. So pretty high mountains uh, within half an hour of uh, the city. Mm-hmm. And so we're traversing at about the nine thousand foot level, and stopped, <clears throat> and we're putting up balloons uh, with some. Uh, chem-like kinds of things uh, on them uh, just to see what would happen. And what was of interest was that I took a number of flash photos, and in some of them you see these kinds of orbs and others absolutely nothing, just, you know, the picture as you would expect it to be. Mm-hmm. So the... So the uh I'm just going to quote you here for a second. It says in your book, with temperatures near freezing, we conducted activities that some contend attract visitors. Now, that sentence really uh, took me. You know, it, it, it captured my interest because what, the, what are those activities, putting up the balloons? Um, inqu- right. Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, we, we were, like I say, primarily using these balloons with, as I say, with the chem lights on them so they would twinkle. So if anybody else saw it, I'm sure they thought those would have been UFOs. But Right, right. Well, it, it would certainly, um, uh, I'm going to skip almost to the end here and um, say that um, you are hosting the uh, Society for Scientific Exploration annual symposium out in Las Vegas in um, June of 2018, and I'm hoping that maybe uh, everybody can take a trip out to Mount Charleston, but I don't know if that's in the offing. Oh, yeah. It's, well, it's if, like enough. I say, it's uh, only about 30 minutes away. Uh, I would mention that the SSC meeting uh, will be here from 7 to 10 June next year, but this is also... Uh, combined with IRVA, the uh, International Remote Viewing uh, Association. So we're going to uh, work together. And that We did one with the Parapsychological Association a few years ago, and it ups the uh, ante. We also have, frankly, a lot of uh, members that happen to belong to both organizations. I think that was part of the thinking in uh, getting, a, uh, uh, getting it here and have a we're going to be at the uh, South Point uh, Hotel and Casino, and the uh, room rates that we've secured are very attractive. 
Okay. Well, I'm a member of both, and so I get two for my one money, and that's going to be right. great. Well, that's why we did it. I mean, there's, we have quite a few folks like you who belong to both organizations, and um, we're, we're still working on the, uh, well, the program committee is working on exactly what will be covered. Excellent. Um, I, I would say that your uh, documentation of your experiences was very meticulous. Um, I, uh, I did a, a swim with the dolphins, and you, you've done swims with dolphins and whales, and uh, I, I did get beamed by uh, some, some dolphins. I did experience that uh, sonar, I guess it is, that they, that they uh, sort of beam at you, and it was an, a very unique experience. Um, did you want to speak about that at all? Well, what we did, uh, we were actually, a, we were, I assume your dolphins were in captivity? No, no. I went out on a um, pontoon-type boat into the Bermuda Triangle with uh, uh, the Marine Mammal Stranding Institute of New Jersey, down in, uh, they're, they're from, they're out of, uh, ne not Neptune, ne Brigantine, New Jersey, and um, they instituted a trip that um, uh, my friend was going to go on, a, a, a lady friend of mine, and um, she uh, got me to go, and I practiced my swimming, and I went out there, and uh, at one point, I was left behind by the boat, and I have to tell you, it, it was it was an experience, but here I am to talk about it today. <laughs> Maybe you uh, just sort of did ESP. Have you seen the movie Open Water? If you want to be scared, oh. no, no, oh, I I have I won't see it. Thank you. I don't want to be scared. I'm scared enough <laughs> as it is. <laughs> but it's about a dive, divers like those who are they're down and come up in the. Uh, boat is gone. <laughs> yes, yes, they were going. I saw it I saw it disappearing into the distance and um I was waving and waving and waving with my uh you know flippers on underneath and they were going 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 and finally I guess that lady friend of mine happened to mention to the woman running the cruise that hey my friend isn't there and so she uh, they came started back towards me and she jumped off uh, uh, the boat and she swam to me and she said now don't worry you uh, I might have to knock you out because you're drowning and I said hey, hold on I'm not drowning I'm swimming you left me I'm here I'm fine <laughs> just take me back onto the boat <laughs> well from a dive master perspective that's inexcusable and uh, they're supposed to make I've done a lot of that and you're supposed to make uh, you know, head counts and have a solid head count before you uh, uh, depart the locations. But in this, we were actually living uh, out in the uh, area north of uh, uh, Bimini. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, our interactions were uh, kind of continued this month for several days, including, and what's in the book uh, is about telepathic communication, where we had the dolphins responding to specific instructions that were being sent to them. Cool. cool. Um, and, and they seemed to respond quite positively and, you know, <clears throat> like major changes in direction and whatnot. And they also, it also describes uh, ones that were run by Scott Jones in, um, uh, where they were in tanks in captivity with very intricate uh, patterns that the dolphins responded to. And again, all of it done telepathically, no hand hand signals or anything like that. And, well, you, uh, quite you, impressive. You have quite a history uh, in the water, <laughs> shall we say. You've, you've gone down uh, in, a, in a shark tank. You swum with whales and with dolphins. And um, also you uh, went uh, looking for the remains of a possible Atlantis near Bimini at one point in the, in the past, the further past. That, that is antiquity, but yes, uh... It goes back to uh, about 1970, uh, somewhere around in there. But, uh, yeah, we were looking at what's known as the uh, Bimini Wall. Uh, 
a lot of questions about what it really is. However, uh, what we saw was a very long, like, 1,800-yard uh, layer of rocks out there that were very geometric in, in uh, you know, specific uh, large rectangles, hexangles, and things of, of that nature. And it was very clear that uh, when you'd swim over it, you have ocean floor on one side, wall, and off the other side, uh, ocean uh, floor again. And um, I forget that. that there were a few books written on that uh, probably 40 years ago. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Alexander, uh, just to get back to generalities as opposed to specificities, uh, in uh, writing the book, you state that your objective for many years has been to, and I'm quoting, has been to assist in making it possible for the young, best, and brightest scientists to explore areas of phenomena without risking their reputation or livelihood. And that does seem to be the problem. You seem to have escaped that. You have made a really nice career for yourself in both the... Oh, uh, yeah. What I tell folks who say that is you want to see the scars. <laughs> really, huh? Uh, because so, uh, um, it is a career killer. Yeah, but you can't... Uh, I get questions periodically from young folks who say, how can I get a career in this and that? And then say, you be independently wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, what, the thing he selected there was, I think, one of the most important points uh, in the book uh, that uh, I do think we need to get um, or make it permissible for people to do this. Um, uh, one of the things I point out, we haven't got to the complexity of what we're talking about yet, but as you know, I look at these phenomena kind of across the board uh, for all of the things that you might, from you know UFOs to psychokinesis to near-death experience to fire walking to uh, Sasquatch to you know da 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 on and on and on. And I think there is a connection, and that consciousness is a key piece of that. So I point out that. Um, Whatever we're looking at is at least as complex as cancer or AIDS. And yet, when you look at the amount of resources placed towards the research on it, it is minuscule at best. You're probably not at, you know, globally one-tenth of one percent of what we put into even rare uh, diseases. Uh, I said my best guess is that maybe $10 million a year is in, uh, you know, globally is put in it. There's, there's no way of knowing because most of this is private donations. Um, but um, uh, for comparison, I point to the Large Hadron Collider where we've spent about $18 billion just to try and find the Higgs boson. And once they did that, then they found out, thinking that would be, quote, the God particle. And you have a step beyond that, and you find out we have pentaquarks that are even smaller. The issue, of course, is a belief system, a materialistic belief system that says we can cut things into smaller and smaller parts, but you always have material at some point. Uh, whereas I think that consciousness uh, transcends those issues and is integral to all of the things that we see and does not behave by what we call the laws of science. Well, I guess you get down to uh, what is called, I believe, the hard question of consciousness because you're always conscious when you're, you're using consciousness to uh, research consciousness, so it, it becomes uh, difficult to parse that somehow. Uh, but I would point to your career and the kind of metamorphosis that you have undergone from the time of being a soldier in the infantry and being, let's say, in Vietnam and, and being in a, in a battle-type 
situation to moving forward in your career and eventually going into the area of non-lethal weapons and now then into being involved with the NIDS project and furthermore going on beyond that and and exploring shamanism. So um, I would say that you have had quite a transformation. Um, yeah. I've been very fortunate in many areas, and some things that happened, particularly in the military, there was a period when I would say, well, if people ask me uh, what I did, I'd say I'm a freelance colonel. Uh, I worked for, uh, you may well know, Bert Subelbein, yes. and we were able to do some very unusual things, and had, it was a, at a time when resources were adequate for doing that and we weren't you know constantly in conflict and had the right kind of um, open-minded leadership that would allow us to do that having said that uh you know Zubelbein paid a huge price uh, for that as well was forced to retire uh because of interest in these areas and the the leadership who did not appreciate what we were doing uh, won that battle. So you have, uh, you know, you have both sides of the coin. People who are wonderful and innovative and supportive, and conversely, the very conservative, uh, well, two aspects of it. One, it can't be done, so therefore it's, it cannot be real. Uh, and the other is, uh, well, Maybe you can do that, but if you do, it's the work of the devil. So right, you right. run into the religious uh, complaints. Well, there seems to be a, a good deal of, uh, uh, of of that in today's uh, military, from what I hear, a lot of people... Uh, I'm not against Christianity by any means. I mean, I was, grew up as a Christian, but this kind of forced... Um, Christian aspect to being in the military and seeing all these things as possibly being satanic as opposed to being just other. Uh, in other words... I, I think if the founder returned, he would not recognize the organization. <laughs> good one. Very good one. I like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, 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 would have to, I would have to agree with that. Um, I was interested in uh, something that you mentioned twice in the book. I mean, there were two separate chapters that ha uh, dealt with uh, things are around levitation because we did we did have uh, 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 Dr. Michael. I, I, I'm right trying now, to think sorry. of his last name. Oh boy, uh, he was on uh, the, the levitation gentleman, the man who wrote the book about levitation most recently. He was anyway. on what? Anyway, anyway, um, and uh, I've had some minor experiences with levitation. And you mentioned about your pull-ups and the dancers, and I had been a dancer, and I know other dancers who talk about going across the floor during dance class, and when they do their jumps, they feel as though they are being held up during their jumps. And you, yep. you I think I mentioned Baristikoff because that was one where they said that uh, they really do think that, uh, you know, there were times that he just seemed to stay aloft uh, longer than uh, is reasonably expected. Right. And, and he's not, he's far from the only one who has reported that. Um, uh, a fellow who was uh, a roommate of mine at one point uh, was a, uh, uh, with the New York Ballet, and he um, would experience the same thing in his jumps, and you experienced something similar when you were doing pull-ups. Um, in in uh, was that in basic training or uh, some some? No, no. Uh, as I point out, I was with the 101st uh, Airborne uh, Division. I was still enlisted as a young medic uh, at the time, and if you wanted to eat daily, you went uh, past the pull-up bar three times a day. And uh, it was one where, like I said, I could at best do eight or ten. Upper body strength has never been as good as, you know, I can run forever. Uh, so um, just all of a sudden, one evening, uh, as I point out, it was like 
I didn't weigh anything. That uh, you know, I wasn't pulling up. I was more or less almost floating, and I did you know every twenty in a row, and just stopped because you know taking up too much time. Wow. Well, I've, I've never been able to do a pull up at all, so uh, I'm I'm in awe of that. But uh, which brings me to the whole idea that you you have quite a regimen to keep yourself physically fit. You travel around the world. You go to Mongolia. You go uh, you go to South America, and uh, you seem to emerge virtually unscathed. Where I think that I probably would, uh, uh, you know, come down with Barry Berry or. Uh, Something terrible. So how well, did you... I'm, I'm probably less than an hour out of the pool now. So you were you were you were saying you swim quite a great deal to stay in shape. I, I do. I swim probably a mile, at least six days a week, and that's because the pool's closed on the seventh. But uh, yeah. Well, that's that's all, a... all the time. That's that's yeah. very good. But well, uh, it's, it's uh, great exercise. It's a whole body. Everything's moving. Uh, and low impact. I ran for many decades, and eventually you pay a price in knees and ankles and whatnot. And so the advantage to swimming is uh, quite amazing. Um, well, th- I guess you do need some impact, though, to keep uh, keep your bones good. No. Oh, you're no, still... No, no you don't yeah, need that. Gra- no. Gravity is still... Um, <laughs> working on us there's yeah. no problem there yeah, no. I mean, it, it, now you do have you talk about astronauts who are in space for long periods of time do have degradation of uh, uh, bones but um, well you also go into uh, sci and the martial arts which uh, and also in just in sports in general um, you know there's so much psychology I, I don't know how would you say I guess psychology whatever uh, where people doing sports will sort of go beyond human abilities for at least a short period of time. But um, the thing that always amazed me was the gymnasts. Uh, I, I, and they'll, they'll do it time and time again. I mean, that to me is supernatural. What, <laughs> no, seriously, what these young women do, and the young men, especially on the rings, I, I find unbelievable. But you find that... Um, they have to sort of prep themselves psychologically before entering a contest. Uh, well, no, we've long known that uh, the mental preparation is at least as uh, important as physical. And uh, yeah, when he talks about the warrior's edge, uh, and even here I talk a lot about NLP, your Neuro Linguistic uh, Programming, and some of the research we did with them, with the ancient uh, Jedi project, uh, that you find that, uh, yeah, that mental rehearsal is certainly as uh, important as uh, uh, physical. Um, the Jedi project that we did, <clears throat> this was another one that uh, the Army Intelligence and Security Command, and we, what we were doing, we had, I've had multi-agencies, um, well, I'll just say several agencies were involved, and one of the things we had in common is everybody shot things, and most of the things with NLP is, you know, it was designed to fix broken people. Uh, we were, were questioning how can we take people who are already good and, you know, it, make them excel, to make them better. And so uh, <clears throat> in this case, what we liked about shooting was it's highly quantifiable. You hit the target or you didn't. You can't say I felt X amount better or something. Um, so we took the, um, uh, well, the best 45 shooters in the world, which happened to be in the Army, and we had the... Uh, Army champion, the inter-service champion, and their boss, and we modeled what they did, what what made them good. And our question is, what's the difference that makes a difference? And we frankly found that we could stress them in various ways. We could make them get far off balance, uh, and they could still shoot very effectively. But 
if we made them do mental exercise, like home Mary had a little lamb while they were shooting, it went to hell immediately. So we found out very quickly that, uh, you know, the muscle memory could account for some things, but the mental aspects of it were absolutely critical. Well, that, that kind of reminds me of uh, doing creative visualization, which is something that I do, and I understand that people who are in sports like uh, tennis players and, and golfers and so forth, where it's a kind of a repetitive thing that they can visualize doing better, that that works quite well. Well, our, uh, the, the models we were using were so good. Now... What they would do before a match is they would shoot the entire match, not just practice how do I take a shot, but they would go through every aspect uh, of of the match. One of the things I might point out that we also found was that their styles were very differently, um, very different. He, we had one who, if you interrupted him at any point, he would stop what he was doing, take off his hat, take off his glasses, unload his weapon, put it back in the box, then take the weapon out of the box, load the weapon, put on the thing, and go through this exquisite routine. And then we had the other one who interrupted him, and he'd go, yeah, okay, bang, and then go back to shooting. Mm -hmm. So what we knew from that was that you didn't have to unload the weapon and put it back in the box and go through all this long, laborious thing, although that is what he did. Mm -hmm. But what we were looking for is what you'd call a critical path model. What is it that all of these people are doing that they have in common and then can we transition that into something that can be used to uh, train other people, understanding what are the critical elements? Did you find that being in the group, in other words, that uh, let's say you said you had 45 shooters, but whether it be 45... Well, 40, 45 is a pistol. That's the caliber of the pistol. That's oh, not I'm, a no. I'm sorry. I misunderstood uh, earlier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but... Whether, whether, and anybody who's worked with the military that will recognize uh, 45 caliber, like nine millimeter or ten. It's actually about a equivalent of a ten millimeter uh, pistol. Okay, um, I think I was. There were a group of people shooting. I am thinking, um, and if the group was like four or more, uh, did you find, let's say, or did you notice that being part of the group and, and kind of intending, if you will, together that this thing was going to happen uh, could help, like the more than one person intending? Uh, no, because they're operating independently. But I'll tell you where that does take over. I mentioned before that I've done a lot of running. Uh, very early in my career, um, uh, you know, I, I went to ranger school and came out as a sergeant and was then sent to 101st Airborne Jump School as an instructor. And so we, as, as such, we took people out on um, runs, usually three, two, you know, the final one was like five-mile run. And what you find out very quickly is that when everybody gets in step, the cadence is, is there, everybody's running, it's very smooth, it's effortless, and whatnot. You have one person that gets out of synchronization with it, and it can destroy the whole, you know, a whole platoon, if you will. But, um, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, synchronization, you, you have people just get, it, it'll pick you up and carry the group along. Well, you know, just to relate it to something that um, that is familiar to me is that, um, you know, I often have people, they tell me they want to get a particular job and they put their, their name down for a job. They went for an interview and so forth. 
And I often tell them to visualize getting the phone call, visualize what the person's going to say to them, because if it's at a tipping point where it's at the 40 to 60 percentile that they're going to get the job, by, by this visualization, they can put it over the edge. And furthermore, if they get their mother or their cousin or their best friend or their significant other to visualize it too, if they can get two or three more people to do it, why that will even bring them closer to pushing pushing things off the tipping point. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I just wondered if you, if you found any uh, agreement in that. Uh, I, I'll put that in the one that I've heard. Uh, have not seen any, you know, like hard evidence that would support it. But uh, if it works, it works. Uh, I'm, 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 there are so many facts. Again, if I get back to, let, let me transition this to another chapter in um, uh, reality denied, and okay. I think the, yes. I'll make the correlation, uh, and that has to do with uh, healing. And I mentioned in there visiting uh, John of God. Oh wow! Uh, yes. Yes. In Abidinia in Brazil. I've seen him a couple of times. And there's been a huge change. Uh, first time we saw him, there were a few hundred people. Uh, the last time, uh, it was three years ago now, there were thousands. I would also point out this is post Oprah. Uh, uh, Oprah went down and did uh, an entire week down there. But it's not just that these people come from around the world. And the point is that uh, there's a room there uh, that I've taken pictures of, and it's filled with uh, crutches and braces and wheelchairs and all of that. Having said that, uh, as I said, that they were there last time, there were thousands coming in. And everybody who came in a wheelchair left in a wheelchair. But I still say it works. Um, and uh, my personal experience at that time, uh, you probably know Whitley Strieber. Sure. Uh, um, I, I have identified what happened with, with his permission, but at the time, Anne was uh, very ill, and I had recommended that they go down, they said, that did not feel that, uh, you know, that they could handle the trip. But they knew I was going down for other purposes, but stopping by uh, Abidinia. So I took, uh, had a picture of Anne and put it in one of their prayer stations and worked uh, with that uh, for a bit. Now, they knew I was going to Brazil, but they didn't know exactly when or where. So I then sent uh, Whitley a uh, uh, email and said, "All right, we have uh, you know I, here here's what I did and when and all of that." And the response was um, that was one of the best few days that she had. She had, had shown improvement. Obviously, did not survive it, but you know significantly improved. Yeah. So. Well the big question that this leads to is why is it that the these sorts of interactions with consciousness be it short term to get a job be it long term for healing that sometimes they work and other times they don't this is why i say it's at least as complex as cancer and we need to begin to explore you know, some of these uh, areas. Well, you go into Bill Bankston, sorry. You go into Bill Bankston and, and his healing um, his healing work with um, uh, yep. ba- basically mice and then furthermore with people. And so it does seem to be um, uh, very positive that, that healing uh, does uh, seem to happen with through consciousness at some time, sometimes, as you say. Well, it does, and of course, Bill's a friend. Did uh, one of the blurbs for the book, um, and I did write to his eff- uh, efforts. I have taken uh, his training. Uh, now, with people, one of the explanations is that it was psychosomatic, and that they 
wanted to get well, so they did in response uh, as opposed to it's an actual psychic uh, intervention. You can't say that with mice because the mice, we do not believe, have a consciousness at a level where they would have the cognitive capability to understand what's going on. And yet we see these repeated experiments that are replicated in other laboratories where well, them mice get better. You know, they have cancer induced into them, and they actually live longer than they should have under normal circumstances had they never been ill. It's, it's quite an amazing. Uh, I, I recently went down to Princeton to see Bill give a, a, a second lecture uh, beyond the one that he did up at uh, up in Yale. So um, he's quite he's quite an interesting and um, innovative gentleman that we hope to have on as well. Um, one of the things that I've o- that's always impressed me about you, uh, John, is that you know everybody. Uh, you've met everybody. <laughs> you have so Quite many, <laughs> so many contacts. I, I point out, as I point out, and the reality uh, denied is that Elizabeth uh, Kubler Ross, who basically brought hospice uh, to the U.S., mm-hmm. ended up uh, uh, serendipitously as the head of my committee for my dissertation. Um, that in itself is an is interesting anecdote, because what happened is I had attended one of her workshops, Life, Death, and Transition. I thought it was really powerful, so uh, I sent her a letter. I was working, assigned in uh, at Fort McPherson, which is in uh, Atlanta, Georgia area, and um, just sent her a letter, said, gee, thanks, it's, uh, you know, really appreciated it, and it was a meaningful experience. Uh, a few weeks later, I got a call from her office that said, uh, Elizabeth is going to be passing through Atlanta. She has a few hours there. Could you meet her? Oh, well, the obvious answer was, well, of course. Um, so at the time, I was getting ready to do a dissertation in a slightly different area. But uh, so I went to the airport and I met Elizabeth. She, uh, it was at the time when you could, you know, go out to the gate, you know, everything mm-hmm. wasn't as uh, strict as it is now. So we went out, met her, and we'd go off to sit down, and she, she says, you know, I know thousands of people in Atlanta, and I chose you to call, and I have no idea why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I said, well, I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to ask you a question, you know, would you head the committee? And she says, oh, yes. Very cool. And that's how it happened. As I say, the rest is history. Well, that is very, very cool. The person that you have met that I have often wondered about and will never meet um, on in 3D or 4D this time around because she's passed um, is Andres Pujarich. And Arich, yeah. Pujarich. And so yeah. um, I was wondering about your impressions of him, how you met him, and so forth. Mm, how did I meet him? Uh, that, again, goes way, way back. I think it, had, it probably had to do with metal bending when Jack Hauk uh, was starting the uh, process. Um, and he was... Uh, Andreo was in the uh, kind of the circle, but as you know, he had been researching these areas decades before that. I'm talking, my interaction was probably early 1980s, probably 81, 82 time frame. Mm -hmm. And um, Jack Hauk uh, was working uh, based on what Uri Geller had done with metal bending Uh and uh, making it to a now known in many communities as spoon-bending parties. Right. I might mention that at the end of Reality Denied, I put in a uh, an annex on how one goes about that. But uh, we were having a um, review uh, a session at my house, and, uh, well, actually it was an apartment, a high-rise in uh, Alexandria, 
and uh, Andrea and Ann Gaiman, who is a, an amazing uh, psychic, was there. And, of course, Subblebein. Uh, and what happened at that event is the thing that led us into doing research in the area of uh, psychokinesis. Um, but after that, Andre and I just kept in touch, and we I would just periodically meet with him and kind of just generically as friends. Well, that must have been very fascinating. And um, I was going to mention uh, towards the end of our interview about that uh, chapter in your book about holding a spoon-bending party, having been to, you know, the Monroe Institute a number of times and having done some of that and experienced it, not, uh, not to the extent where things just bent without me touching it, but more or less that the spoons, when you get into that zone, whatever it is, it's sort of like when you bend the spoon, it's like putting the amount of effort that you would put into bending a, a heavy-duty aluminum foil type of situation. Mm. And it just kind of bends, um, it seems sort of warm and uh, almost well, molten. Uh, but but the effects vary greatly, and those are all real and, and can be experienced. Uh, what happened at this particular evening, it was the second uh, session I had attended, and we held it specifically for uh, Bert Subblebein so he could see what, what, you know, what it was like. And we were sitting in kind of an oval, and it just happened that, the, as I said, Ann Gaiman, who's a very well-known psychic, uh, was sitting directly across from him, uh, Andrea and his then wife and uh, Captain Joe Dick and a few other people were a little bit further off to my right. And we get to the final session, which includes no uh, physical manipulation. You simply hold the uh, two forks uh, together and... Um, what happened was that uh, things were sort of winding down, and it was holding uh, her two forks up, and all of a sudden, in front of Bert, which was important, dropped a full 90 degrees. And that's with no touching, you know, other than holding it at the base, but no physical force applied. And that's uh, we went in the corner, huddled, says, my God, what just happened? <laughs> You know? That's quite amazing. That's quite amazing. Yeah. Um, we had that. I mean, those sorts of bends occur once in a while. You don't see that dramatic. We saw a lot where you might see tines bend, uh, again, in isolation without physical contact. Uh, but uh, we have several, and I described some in the book, that were, you know, I, I learned how to teach this, and we were doing it, I might mention the important aspect of this. We were using this with uh, senior military officers, and I would also get questions like, what are you going to do, bend tank barrels? And I'd say, no, I want to move electrons. Mm. Because digitization was just coming in, computers were being adopted, and said, I don't need to actually ruin computers, I just have to make them unreliable. But our point and, uh, you know, presenting this to the senior officers. This was an intelligence community, and, and the point was do not just reject things because you don't believe it can be done. We had been blindsided a few times, uh, by the, you know, it was then the former, you know, Soviet Union, and certain things emerged that caught us unexpected, and then when you went back and look, you found out the information was there. It had just been rejected because, you know, we didn't know how to do it. And, you know, with the egocentricity of Americans, you know, if, if we don't know how to do it, nobody else possibly could. Uh, right. Well, you know, uh, earlier on you had mentioned the Hadron Collider, which keeps breaking down matter into smaller and smaller uh, particles. But would you, uh, let me just quote from your book again. Uh, you state that more important when viewed in aggregate, the evidence in favor of multiple phenomena physically interacting with humans in consensus reality 
is overwhelming. So what you're trying to say with all these facts and um, uh, sort of episodes that you've described is that you believe that there is an underlying reality that has not yet been discovered or even really thoroughly researched. Is that correct? Well, I disagree. Do you it's absolutely know? discovered. It's ignored. But, uh, but well, it, it is. It is happening right in front of us and just is a priori disregarded. Well, it is true. But then, so your uh, thesis really is that this should obviously not been disregarded, but more thoroughly researched. Well, and, and brought uh, yes, out into the open. But I also go into, and I think one of the critical issues is the importance of belief systems. Well. And I often point to Brazil in this case. Mm-hmm. The point is, in the West, uh, and Western-oriented education, we have this materialistic view, which is very delimiting as to what can and cannot be accepted. When I deal with the shamans, I talk about, you know, a spirit world and the real world. Now, in the West, if you even accept the possibility, you see them as separate and distinct. My point in Brazil is that you have people who are very highly educated, normally in Western traditions, and yet they have integrated... Uh, spiritism and, uh, you know, all of these spiritual aspects into their life and are willing to accept that these things occur. If you assume that they don't occur, then why would you research them? But they absolutely do occur. Uh, in UFOs, we, you know, we talk about alien beings and, and uh, interactions. And I point out that uh, throughout human history, there are reports of humans dealing with sentient, non-human, intelligent beings. Um, And this shows up in every culture. Uh, Globally, there's no, you know, geographic uh, restrictions on it. Um, And so the question has got to be, why are these things occurring? And yet, when they get reported in Western civilization, it is just assumed that it must be a hallucination. Yet we have strong evidence for physical interactions that take place. So, so you're saying that the Western belief systems are what actually is holding back research into these phenomena? Absolutely. No, that's interesting. And yet, uh, it certainly has also produced some excellent uh, results. Um, and... I, I think the original paradigm of science was such that it did produce better results, and I have to agree with you. I think that the materialistic uh, belief system is starting to overwhelm even science. Uh, for well, ex- I, I've talked to that extensively in the book, and so mm-hmm. I don't take this my uh, position uh, in uh, Reality Tonight as being anti-science. Right. Science has produced many wonders. We have expanded, you know, uh, extended life uh, considerably. If you look at just what happened in the last decade, or I'm sorry, the last century, for instance, uh, the things that have occurred throughout the world. You know, and from a practical standpoint, you know, if you throw the switch on a light, you want the light to go on, most of the time it works. And most of the time is good enough for many of the things that we do. What I'm interested in are the things that don't fall into most of the time, like ghosts showing up in your bedroom or levitation or, you know, interaction with entities or spontaneous healing. Those are the ones that interest me. But the problem with all of them is that they are, are a one-time event, that the data is difficult to collect on them. Not that it's impossible, but again, uh, I would say to be able to collect it effectively, you would have to alter the belief system and the whole paradigm of science as it's recognized today. Just for example, when Fleming uh, found that bread mold inhibited bacteria, a lot of people would have said, well, so what? You know, and and yet he went on to further that investigation, up against some serious odds. Uh, Marie Curie is another one, but I I think the 
older scientists had a little bit easier time of overcoming a belief system that's become seriously entrenched, and I think that's what you're addressing in this book. Well, yeah, like I say, uh, the, our problem is a belief structure that does not allow for anything that is not preordained. Mm-hmm. You know, we mm-hmm. delimit research, and as I've said before, you know, what we need is to get the best and brightest people and allow them to doing it without, uh, you know, risking their reputation or livelihood. I put my experience uh, in there, but it may defer to uh, John Mack, uh, who, yeah. as oh, you yeah. know, you know, here, here was a premier uh, psychiatrist, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, and he wrote about alien abductions, and because of that, is sanctioned mm-hmm. by, you know, Harvard University. He was a tenured professor. Things that are not supposed to happen were done to him strictly because of the topic, not because of, you know, how he went about it. The yeah. same with uh, Bob John, who was dean of the School of Engineering at uh, Princeton. Yes. And I point to the book, uh, you know, how how that was treated even after he left. And these people have impeccable credentials. Peter Sturrock, who uh, wrote a book that I recommend, uh, Tale of Two Sciences. Again, he uh, comes with impeccable uh, sciences, a stand, uh, impeccable credentials at Stanford University. Um, and his work on microwave research is considered premier uh, his work with UFOs is considered heresy. Well, heretics, are, it's a bad thing to be a heretic. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, but you can't, you know, we've talked now about people who were big enough that they, you know, they, they didn't get fired over that, although they tried with John Mack. Uh, but, you know, are considered to be uh, heretics. Uh, and you can't go to young scientists or come. I got to make a living. You know, they're yeah. out there, going to have families. They've got to be supported. Put uh, beans on the table, as one of my uh, <laughs> colleagues uh, used to say about that. And you know, if you get a reputation of dabbling too far afield, um, it's going to affect your livelihood. Because uh, really, a, a basic um, investigator hardly makes any living as it is until they become head of a lab. And to get to be head of a lab, you cannot be a heretic uh, because of grants. And I think you mentioned, too, that money talks, and certainly Big Farm uh, starts to play a part in Western medicine as well. And, y- you know, it's a shame that you can't somehow or other, as you said, step not out of the box but never be in the box at all. But mm. it is difficult. It's a box. Yeah, I, I really think. Uh, yeah, I, I really think that. That's a phrase I really don't like. But, I, uh, I, I know don't you mentioned it. That. You mentioned it, but I, I think you did a great service by writing this book, and um, I hope you serve as a, uh, you know, as an example to people that do have enough courage to uh, stop you know, just get out of their own way and start investigating what they want to investigate because you're an ex- excellent example. You seem to have had a wonderful life and a very interesting career, and I hope people take uh, courage from that. Before we take too much of your time, I see that we are just about at an hour, but I do do want to uh, mention uh concurrent to what uh, Kate has said uh, that I kind of think that many people are also exhibit fear because if you live in a mechanistic universe, very materialistic and mechanistic view of reality, things can be controlled. And I think that some of the people that hold fast to this mechanistic point of view are terrified of the the idea that things are perhaps out of their control and that there are unseen forces that aren't just uh, you know, phys- physics, basic physics 101. But um, beyond that, um, I wanted to get to the questions. Uh, I have a couple questions from listeners, and um, I think you may have answered. One is from um, a couple here from uh, Freeman, who has been, uh, he's, he's in the UK. He's a radar expert, and he's very 
very interested in the UFO phenomena, so he questions uh, something about that. He said... He says here, given that both the U.S. and Russia have investigated and exploited paranormal effects like remote viewing, is it likely that rational ET civilizations would also research and explore and exploit the paranormal? So this is from uh, Freeman, one of our regular listeners. So I put that out to you. Is that a question? (laughs) <laughs> or what's the question? That sounds more like a statement. Well, he wants to know, is it likely that uh, the ETs would also research and exploit the paranormal? I would have to say, yeah. uh, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know what you would uh, say. Well, I think we did address that okay. um, early on. And it is that my experience is that these things are generally personality dependent meaning that if you have people who are uh, positively disposed towards it, particularly in leadership positions, uh, they will, uh, you know, allow certain research. Uh, One of the examples that I give uh, in other book, UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies, and Realities, is talking to an individual who had been the head of one of our three-letter intelligence uh, agencies who said, A, we don't do that, meaning the institution. B, I'll tell you about the ones I saw. So the point is that uh, is uh, it did not have his institution exploring it, but B had no trouble believing it because he'd actually seen UFOs. Right, right. So I'm going to move on to another listener question, and then I'm going to ask you my Final question that is not about the book, okay? So okay. Um, the, the listener question uh, from Will is, um, any of the extreme weather uh, situations that we've been experiencing, um, are they possibly engineered uh, like the fires or the hurricanes, given that you spoke about weather modification, James Mio and uh, Wilhelm Reich? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, longer answer is welcome to the world of global uh, climate change, and I do think that it's, uh, unless you mean engineered, uh, not intentionally, but uh, uh, hu- humanly derived. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, good answer on that one. So um, I'm going to move to my final question before we thank you extremely much for coming on Shattered Reality. And my final question has to do with uh, something that has just happened in the past 10 days in the field of um, ufology. And that is that some people, uh, one of whom uh, I am, have been acquainted with very vaguely, and that I know that you know much better than I do, uh, one Harold Puthoff uh, got on the stage... Well. With um, uh, w- uh, the guy uh, from Blink, uh, DeLong, yeah. DeLong, Tom DeLong, Tom DeLong. I was going to call him John DeLong. Uh, Tom DeLong, and um, got on the stage with a bunch of other people that I would imagine you might know some of those folks. And, I, I know most of them. Yeah. Right. Right. So. Um, uh, what's your opinion of what is going on there with Tom DeLong and asking for money and uh, uh, research, education, and entertainment, and um, and what are these guys doing up there? <laughs> In short, uh, well, I think this was widely misunderstood as to what their the, the TV thing uh, that they did, uh, it was, uh, it's basically an investment offering. Uh, They have a group of, you know, brilliant, uh, well-connected folks together who would like to do serious research. Um, Tom's thinking on it is to incorporate you know, take both the research aspect and the entertainment aspect. One of his personal concerns is uh, kind of exciting the younger generation who do not uh, have not expressed the level of interest. When you attend the meetings like the SSE and many of others, uh, we're basically dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> certainly populated by a, uh, a much older generation and 
they're trying to uh, get uh, younger folks more integrally involved. Well, that's a good thing. That's definitely a good thing. But people have people have uh, commented that uh, Tom DeLong, in his books and in his uh, language in other interviews, has um, kind of indicated that he believes that um, any uh, aliens, we're going to call them aliens because we don't know for sure that they're extraterrestrials, they could be coming yep. from... Uh, from another dimension or, you know, that sort of thing, other consciousnesses, which we're going to call aliens for the moment, that they're very negative and they need to be shot out of the sky. And there are people out there who have uh, thought that, well, maybe a lot of them are positive. And uh, why is he portraying the negative side of it? I know that you may not have the answer to this. Uh, the that definitive... I don't. Yeah. I, I have read the material. I've seen commentary on on both sides of it. Uh, the, again, the people that I know, I have spoken with Tom, I have not physically met him. Uh, I know several of the others, some of them quite well. Um, and their interest is uh, in R&D perspective, how can we move the science forward? And uh, We'll, we'll see. The last time I looked, I haven't been on for a couple of days, but they had only raised a few hundred thousand dollars, which is nowhere near, you know, he was projecting 50 million. So unless something changes dramatically, uh, the, the amount that they already uh, had invested would not be, it begin to do research. I have talked to the COO, who's again, personal friend, and they have a requirement that if they don't reach a million, or I'm sorry, a minimum, which is multi-millions, that they must return the money to the investors. I see. Well, I, just for the record, I don't have a dog in that race, but I was interested in your perspective on it. And uh, yeah. I figured well, you'd what have I one. encourage every anybody who's interested is to carefully read page seven, which is the risk assessment. Of, of their of their initial offering yeah. is that it? Extremely high risk as an investment perspective. Well, I, I don't I don't have that kind of money anyway, so I wasn't I wasn't uh, personally uh, interested in investing. But I was very interested in the group of uh, gentlemen that were up there and the fact that they seemed uh, kind of high level and uh, wondering they are. what the heck was going on exactly. No, so, they're real. Yes, yes, I I imagine they are. So um, before we say goodbye, would you like to uh, repeat the name of your book and talk about the SSE? Uh, uh, we've got Reality Denied here with John B. Alexander, Ph.D., and uh, it's the firsthand experiences with things that can happen but did. And that is from Anomalist Books. And once again, um, in terms of Las Vegas next year, you've got the dates in your head, and I know it's June 2018. Uh -huh. 7 to 10 June. And this is a combination of SSE, Society for Scientific Exploration, and uh, the International Remote Viewers Association. And um, I'm planning on being there if my, if my health is good and I have the money to fly, I'll, why, I'll be oh. there. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> of course, I'm the local host. <laughs> yes, you are. So is there anything else that would you would like to say before we uh, bid you a fond farewell? Yeah, let's make it uh, possible for young scientists to get involved in these areas without risking their livelihood or reputation, because we're looking at something that's at least as complex as cancer. Okay. Well, I, I agree with you there 100%, and uh, I, I wish you well, and I hope a lot of young scientists are listening. I think you have encouraged them. I agree. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. All righty. Bye bye. Well, yeah, go ahead. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I, it was a very interesting thing and a great book. I, I really do. I I wasn't just trying to uh, flatter him. The book was so well written. I really enjoyed it. He, he certainly is a man of 
uh, just tremendous experience. And the way he writes, it's like sitting down, having dinner with him, and having a very interesting conversation. I, I enjoyed it very much. To, uh, that was Reality Denied. Reality Denied. First-hand experiences with things that can't happen but did with um, John B. Alexander, Ph.D. And I, I, as well, I enjoyed the book. And in fact, there were so many things to talk about that mm -hmm. I felt like we kind of, you know, I felt right. like I was skipping around from place to place. Yeah. And it, I, I wish I had a more uh, of a... Uh, a, a, a focus, but there were so many things in that book, and I cannot say more to recommend it to you listeners to go out, buy the book, and read it, okay? So, um, I don't know who's coming up next on Shattered Reality, but we do have another, uh, we do have another show planned in the not-too-distant future, and we will continue on. Uh, yeah, whatever. But what? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway. I, I don't know. You got me by surprise. Yes, we will continue on. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, this week we don't have a listener uh, experiencer corner person, but we felt that the time would be more than filled by um, uh, John B. Alexander, and, and it was. So uh, I think it's time to say goodbye for today. What Sounds do you like, think? Okay. So. Goodbye from Shattered, Shattered Reality. reality.